last time this many students were out on Indonesia's streets, they toppled a dictator's 30-year reign. But will these latest protests change the mind of a president who won 55% of the vote? I'm Imran Garda, and today on The Newsmakers, we ask if Indonesia's democracy is in a state of decline. In recent months, Jakarta has seen the country's worst post-election violence since the fall of President Suharto in 1998. Back then, the military-backed administration was credited with spurring economic growth and increasing living standards, but was also known for rampant corruption and crackdown on any form of dissent. Could President Joko Widodo be taking a page from that playbook? Elected for a second term six months ago, alongside celebrities and a few former politicians found guilty of corruption, even his own supporters are now questioning his commitment to reform, thanks to some controversial proposals. As he faces man-made chaos in the capital, he also has to deal with wildfires and the aftermath of flooding. But his biggest challenge may be needing to restore people's faith in democracy and in his ability to safeguard it. Natalie Pahernan explains. These were the biggest student protests in Indonesia in more than 20 years. With demonstrations across the archipelago, from Sumatra to Sulawesi. The protesters were voicing their anger over law reforms, as well as changes that would weaken the nation's anti-corruption agency, known as the KPK. The parliament's plan to overhaul the colonial-era criminal code included provisions that would limit sexual and reproductive rights and make it illegal to insult the president. There are ideological divisions among the protest groups and their demands are varied, but they do appear united in their desire to hold on to democratic freedoms. This movement is seen as a test of both President Joko Widodo's leadership and Indonesian democracy. There has been a win of sorts for protesters. The president has pushed back parliament's vote on changes to the penal code. Saya juga memerintahkan Menteri Hukum dan HAM untuk kembali menjaring masukan-masukan dari berbagai kalangan masyarakat sebagai bahan untuk menyempurnakan RUU KUHP yang ada. But the bill curbing the abilities of the anti-corruption watchdog has already passed. Joko Widodo, commonly called Jokowi, hasn't ruled out reviewing it again. But there is frustration here that the changes were even put forward in the first place. We reject the revision of the anti-corruption law, which has weakened the KPK, because it's illogical and unreasonable. It's just a few months since Jokowi won office for the second time. The first time around, he campaigned on a reformist agenda. As part of his campaign this year, he ran on a platform of clean governance. So the changes which went before the parliament and the president's initial support for them have disappointed some of his base. The protests have also shown that for some of the public, there are real fears about the health of Indonesia's democracy, even under a democratically elected president. On October 20, Jokowi will be inaugurated for his next five years in office. One of the most immediate challenges he'll have to address will be the political unrest created in the last days of his first term. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. We're here to discuss what some of those challenges are. Let's go to the Indonesian city of Malang, where I'm joined by protester Mariam Jamila. Mariam, good to have you on the program. Does it take a lot of courage to be a part of these protests? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mariam, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Does it take a lot of courage to be a part of these protests? Okay. Um, okay, uh, 
In the past few days, Indonesia has been widening the largest uh, movement since the 80s. Um, and this is, I think, uh, the biggest protest uh, after the last student protest, broke to, who, which broke down the President Suharto. And this is uh, the more special is the protest is not only held in the capital, but the protest is held in all city in Indonesia, in all the capital city, in all the province in Indonesia. And then we have in this protest, we not only uh, have one demon, we come with seven demons, mm -hmm. which all the demons is we will no one left behind. So we will, we won't stop if all uh, the demons is clearly. Right. And when I look at those demands, it seems that there's a common yeah. thread. A part of it seems to be that mm. this is young people against an old system or youth versus tradition. Is that how yeah. you feel about it? Yes, uh, all the demons, uh, all the seven demons is about our reformation, which is uh, have been called by the governor. As you know, the last biggest protester uh, in the Indonesia, which broke down the President Suharto, we call as a reformation. But no, until 20 years after the reformation, we found out that our reformation has been called. And then we try to uh, come to the street and then we ask seven demons uh, that this is must be clearly. Maybe I can tell you about the Elaboration of the seven. Oh, no, you, you don't have to, uh, um, uh, um, Maria. Maria, yeah. you, you don't have to go through the seven. But I wonder if you think oh. J President Jokowi mm -hmm. is listening to the protesters. Yes. I think he's not listening. Our uh, our movement is uh, we want to show the governor, the parliament, and the executive that we are. It's not we don't have any trust in them. And then the uh, President Jokowi, until now, uh, he never listened to our, uh, our demon. Like, we asked him for the, uh, the, for the reject criminal code bill, and mm -hmm. he said that he only wants to pending the criminal code bill. And this is really different. And when we uh, asked him for the revoke uh, commission uh, Corruption law. He said that uh, he came to revoke the commission corruption law because uh, many political reasoning. And this is uh, the this is proof that they never listen to us. I see. I see. Mariam, looking forward to talking to you again sometime soon. But I yeah. thank you so much for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Well, to broaden out the discussion, now let's go to Surabaya, where Drajad Wibowo joins us. He's a member of the Council of Honor with the Opposition National Mandate Party, which ran against Joko Widodo's party. In Jakarta, we have Shoaib Kagda, the founder of the Indonesia Economic Forum. And Andreas Harsono is a researcher with Human Rights Watch and the author of Race, Islam and Power, Ethnic and Religious Violence in Post-Suharto Indonesia. Thank you all for joining us. Andreas, let me start with you. Is there a common thread of human rights when it comes to those seven demands? Well, human rights organizations in general supported all of those demands because these are about anti-corruption, these are about forest fire, these are about past human rights abuses, and these are also about West Papua, uh, the long lingering human rights problem in Indonesia. Of course, human rights organizations welcome the student demands. Hmm. Shoaib Kagda, to the point that Mariam Jamila, Jamila made, people are out there on the streets, they're risking a lot. Some of them are getting beaten up and sometimes even worse by the police. They're putting it out there and she feels that the president's not listening. Based on all the av available evidence up until this point, is she right? I think the, she's right in the sense that the president's hands are tied, I think, in terms of whether how much uh, room he has to maneuver within this new uh, structure of a coalition government that he is trying to form for his second term. So I think the question is, 
can he, even if he listens, can he do something about it? Uh, at the moment, it seems that, you know, his political, political allies will not allow him much room, uh, right. especially on the, on the uh, KPK law, which is very, very serious. And I think it will also have a major impact on investor confidence in Indonesia, which no one else, which at the moment, it doesn't seem to have taken a priority. But I think that will come to the fore. Okay, so as we try and demystify some of this, Shoaib, and of course, yes, there are commonalities among the demands, but some of them, I mean, on the one hand, it's about extramarital sex and, you know, criminalizing this. On the other hand, it's about corruption. It's about the rights for Papuans and so on. Is it correct then to say that because of who his political allies are, and they tend to be often conservative hardliners, that makes it very difficult for him to budge on any of these. Is that, uh, in essence, correct? Well, I think, yeah, uh, it's difficult for him to budge on... See, some of the demands are actually to roll back some of the, the two major laws, but the other demands are tied to ongoing government action so I think you need to separate them. On the ongoing government action, I think Jokowi has room to maneuver. On the two laws, uh, he's, he's, he's asked for a delay of the criminal code, which I think is very good. But he has no room to maneuver on the anti-corruption law. And that, I think, is a testament. Uh, at, it, it's a huge indictment of the political elite, because I think that they're ring-fencing themselves and protecting themselves. And that is bad, mm. bad for democracy and bad for the country. Drajad Wibowo, do you share Shoaib's view that because of the way the system is created, that he has not a lot of room to maneuver within because it's going to upset the apple cart? Um, let me start by saying that uh, Indonesian political elites is like uh, small fillets, maybe even small sub fillets, that uh, we uh, know each other's color, true colors. Um, well, we even know uh, uh, some of each other's uh, secret, uh, private secrets. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 when observers say that, uh, well, his room of maneuvering is uh, very tight or so on, um, no, that's not the case. Uh, but I cannot reveal it in public uh, what's really happening. But uh, the Why point not? is, uh, oh, well, for, for, for many reasons. Um, and I'm still, I'm still in, in the uh, political elite circle at the moment. Uh, but uh, 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 most of my journalist colleagues, uh, senior colleagues, uh, 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 senior journalist friends here, they know that uh, I'm against the revision of the anti-corruption law. Right. And, 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 and I think uh, the, the key factor that unified the students' movement and also um, uh, upset uh, Pat Jokowi's base is uh, his, uh, his agreement uh, to, uh, to end up the, the, the revision of the law. Right. Uh, 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 and that's, that's, right. that's one of, yeah. uh, that's a very big mistake on, on Yeah, Dreja, something that I'm trying to understand here, it doesn't seem as if people feel let down by him. It's not as if they feel like they, they said, we voted for you based on, on this platform and now you reneged on it, right? It seems as if what they are protesting about is something larger than even the election. So, People voted, 55% of people voted for Jokowi, but it's not as if they're saying, no, we want Prabowo in charge. No, no, they're, no. they're protesting something bigger than this, right? So is, is the yes, sort yes. of election almost irrelevant here because they believe that the system is rotten underneath whoever they choose as, as the president of the country? Um, yeah, well, your first point is correct. It's not about that they want Prabowo instead of Jokowi. No, that's not the case. Uh, but they are very disappointed with what Pak Jokowi did with the KPK, uh, KPK law. And you uh, you need only to look at uh, two major uh, printed media here. Um, can I name the media? Mm -hmm. Which, uh, uh, Tempo and Compass, uh, that is, uh, they, they used to be, uh, to be, Hardliner uh, Jokowi supporters, but now look at uh, look at Tempo. 
uh, you know, uh, uh, their uh, front page. Uh, so Pak Jokowi's picture with uh, Pinocchio behind it, Pinocchio mm -hmm. Sedu behind it. So uh, uh, I met many of uh, Pak Jokowi's uh, key supporters and uh, the anti-corruption key supporters, and they are very, very bitterly disappointed with this approval. Uh, uh, to the right. uh, and, uh, KPK, uh, KPK law. And please uh, uh, keep in mind that, uh, uh, well, publicly, people uh, is given information that uh, that it is uh, the parliament initiative to uh, revise the uh, KPK law. But uh, uh, just, uh, just check on the documents, you will see the, uh, uh, whose initiative it is really. Right. Okay. So... Andreas, talking about the media, Drajad mentioned the media and maybe some of those who were strong backers of Jokowi are having a change of heart right now. The Jakarta Post had an editorial which said, our democracy is at stake. Is it really that bad? Is there a question mark hanging over the entire Indonesian democracy? Oh yes, that is true. If we take a look at many, many indicators, press freedom, freedom of expressions, uh, democratic elections, uh, all those indicators say that Indonesia is regressing. So the Jakarta Post, Tempo, they are not wrong. They are very accurate in saying that Indonesia democracy in regressions. In fact, an Australian university, the, Nation, the ANU, Australian National University, uh, held a seminar whose title is Regressions of Indonesia's Democracy. What Indonesia is facing now, of course, it is much bigger than Jokowi. Indonesia is now facing a two-pronged danger. On one prong, we are seeing the rise of political security and business elite trying to grab power, trying to make laws that will be beneficial to them, the KPK law, the mining law, the water law. On the other side, we are also seeing the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. They are trying to inject the so-called Islamic Sharia into the criminal code that will discriminate non-Muslim minorities, uh, women, LGBT, and also going to violate right. religious freedom, freedom of expressions, and the others. Right. Okay. So, Shuaib, that dovetails with what you were saying, right? We separate it out into sort of two camps here. On the one hand, the political elite trying to protect themselves, enrich themselves, and on the other hand, a slide towards conservatism. If you were the president, Shuaib, and you, you were faced with these <laughs> seven demands, right? What would be easiest to give the protesters right now out of those seven demands? Maybe to take some of the sting out of the protests and maybe to start some dialogue. Well, the I think... Uh, for me is Andres, that's for Shuaib. Andres, that's, that's for Shuaib. Shuaib, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm not the president, but I think uh, Jokowi has already indicated that he will meet he will meet the uh, students. But I think the what he can really give uh, uh, very directly at the moment is a pledge to roll back the anti-corruption law because that's in his power to do. He can issue a presidential decree to roll that back. It's very I mean it's totally in his hands in terms of uh, trying to uh, quell the uh, unrest in Papua and some of the other issues, he will need the, the uh, security apparatus to come in and uh, do that job. But mm -hmm. if he was to pledge to roll back the anti-corruption law, I think that would be probably uh, something within his power oh, to, right. to do. Okay, so Drajad, you don't have to name names here publicly, mm -hmm. but if he decides to roll back that anti-corruption law, which would, you know, take away some of the powers of those who would investigate the politicians and hold truth to power. Who would be upset? Who would stand to lose? And how damaging would this be for the president? Don't name names, but give me an idea. Well, um, my first question is whether he will do it. Uh, it is not presidential decree, it's called PERPU, and uh, PERPU is like emergency uh, bills. Uh, uh, will he issue the emergency bills? Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, based on what I heard from my colleagues, um, political colleagues, I mean, uh, um, uh, I still doubt it. Uh, it will be great if he does it, but uh, at the moment, I still, still very much in doubt 
if uh, he will uh, do it. Uh, if he uh, did it, well, uh, he will uh, upset political establishment. Um, he will upset some uh, some of his uh, big supporters. Uh, I mean, big supporters is not political parties, uh, uh, the other section of the community is uh, big supporters. And um, I don't know how, how he will uh, he will balance it and how uh, how will he uh, he deal with it. But the way I see it now, the uh, the student movement, uh, the youth movements, uh, they are against political establishment. Uh, and uh, very unfortunately, now Pak Jokowi is seen by student activists as the uh, symbol of uh, political establishment. Well, uh, it's 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 something that's surprising me actually because uh, mm -hmm. uh, after what happened in the election and then uh, something really uh, really big uh, uh, happening like this and uh, it's uh, very surprising and and uh, and uh, as a member of political parties outside the government, I'm just uh, sit and wait and see how we right. uh, how it will develop. But the fact that they see you all as the same, Drajad. I can understand why mm -hmm. it disheartens you, but they're saying you're all corrupt, you all need to leave, and we need to start from scratch here. They're, yeah. they're right, I aren't they? I agree. Yes, yes, I agree that uh, they see, uh, quote unquote, as all politicians are corrupt. Uh, that's the way they see it, and I think that's the challenge, uh, uh, the big, very big challenge uh, for politicians like me uh, in order to you know, to uh, to win back the trust of the public that uh, our reformations, uh, which uh, me personally as part of it, uh, uh, is not being hijacked by uh, the new Indonesian political establishment and the new Indonesian uh, business establishments. Um, uh, that's that's a big homework for us, um, and uh, I hope. Uh, uh, my party uh, uh, will be able to to show that uh, we are really the party of reformation. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's that, there is a, a, a very serious uh, soul searching here for right. for all Indonesian political well, parties. Well, and it's good to hear your own personal soul searching here on on the show, uh, Andreas. As we look ahead, can we can we say that? the elections were almost a smokescreen for some deeper problems in the country because everybody celebrated the elections uh, being an example of Indonesian democracy at play. All these tens of millions of people had voted and it was free and fair and so on. Was it a smokescreen for something far more rotten and something that takes much longer to fix? Oh, yes, absolutely correct. Indonesian democracy is basically just the electoral democracy, the lowest ranking of all types of democracy. This is a democracy that does not respect, does not protect uh, minorities' rights, the rights of religious minorities, women, LGBT. This is a democracy, the, political, the system is very centralized into Jakarta. All political parties should have headquarters in Jakarta. And these parties are controlled, like Drajat uh, said, controlled basically by the party bosses. And the party bosses are the ones that, that can have a say in basically everything in the parliament, national, local, provincial level. So the system is rotten. We need to review the system of democracy in Indonesia. We need to review the centralized nature of political parties in Indonesia. In a country as big as Indonesia, 34 provinces ranging from you know, this is bigger than Europe, uh, but the system is so centralized, this is the problem that we are seeing. But of course, uh, people like Jokowi, like parliament members, like ministers general, they should understand that this system has to be reviewed, not going back to the new order era, like Megawati Sukarno Putri and some politicians would like to see, but going forward to be a an open democracy, a decentralized democracy that will empower people, that will empower villages from the village level up to the Jakarta level. Mm -hmm. Is there enough appetite, Shoeb, to decentralize? Take, for example, this issue with Papua, right? They don't want to lose control over it, do they? 
No, absolutely not. I think uh, they they were very they were very badly burned when um, East Timor broke away from Indonesia, uh, and I was on the ground in in Dili at that time. It was it was something that really hurt uh, the Indonesian security apparatus, especially, and, and I think they will not make the same mistake again with uh, with Papua. Um, I would like to also add on to Mr. Drajat's uh, and, uh, comments. You know, the political elite in Indonesia is forming an oligarchy. It doesn't matter which party is in power, they mm -hmm. exchange power. It goes round and round in circles, and any outsider is, is pushed out. You know, whether it's PDIP in power or whether it's Garindra in power, does it really make a difference? Because at the end of the day, they do backdoor deals, they do backroom right. deals. So the elite have to me, hijacked Indonesia's okay. democracy. Listen, Shoaib, Shoaib, we're out of time, but it's been a pleasure talking yes. to all of you. Shoaib Kagda, Andreas Harsono, Drajad Wibowo, and earlier, Mariam Jamila. Pleasure talking to you all. Fascinating insight into Indonesian politics. Bye-bye for now.